I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. And I think that we're going to talk about something that many people may not have heard about as it relates to HPV vaccination, um, particularly as it relates to disparities. I'd like to present some acknowledgments and disclosures. Uh, the first is that I have served as a voting member of the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices, specifically as a member of the HPV work group. I've also served on other work groups and also chaired the uh, adult work group. Uh, some disclosures are that I have also served on the external advisory boards of the um, pharmaceutical companies listed here, uh, but I do want to let you know that the information that I will present today will be consistent with the ACIP and will be free of bias. We have a number of objectives today. Uh, one, the first, to understand the importance of vaccination. We'll also understand HPV infection and disease, recognize some of the health disparities that I alluded to, and then understand the potential for HPV vaccinations to reduce health disparities, particularly when we start at younger ages. It's probably no secret to anyone who certainly is over the age of 50 that vaccines are one of the greatest public health achievements, not just in the United States, but actually in the world. And every year in the United States, it, the vaccines are responsible for averting about two to three million deaths. Vaccinations have actually increased life expectancy during the 20th century. And like no other therapy um, or procedure, vaccines have eradicated disease. I mentioned those of us who are over 50, we might actually remember uh, getting our smallpox inoculation. And I still have the scar from that inoculation. But we don't see smallpox in this country and polio is actually nearly eradicated. But not only do immunizations have the opportunity to eradicate disease, they also have the opportunity to reduce health disparities. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. And we've seen immunizations reduce health disparities uh, through the disparities that were reduced through uh, measles vaccination. And so, as you can see, health disparities are really a health outcome that's seen to a greater or a lesser ex extent between populations. And talking about HPV gives us an opportunity to see um, health disparities in a direction that we might not expect, particularly when we talk about some of the racial and ethnic d disparities that you'll see shortly. Um, and I, I also wanted to highlight, we also often talk about health disparities as it relates to racial and ethnic disparities, but there are other dis dimensions to consider. And today we'll consider uh, social economic status as well. But also remember that age, disability, socioeconomic status, as we mentioned, all of these things contribute to an individual's ability to achieve good health. And in fact, most of us are impacted by intersectionality, which means, in fact, we may have multiple factors that impact our ability to achieve good health. So HPV is transmitted through intimate skin-to-skin -skin contact. And it is the most prevalent sexually transmitted infection. In fact, most people will be infected with at least one type of mucosal HPV in their lifetime. Currently, about 79 million Americans are infected and about 14 million new infections occur per year. The most common time when people are infected are actually during their teens and early 20s. The great thing about this is that the majority of infections are asymptomatic. In fact, most of them will resolve on their own 70% uh, over one year and 90% by two years. However, it's not possible to necessarily know initially when those, uh, which infections will actually resolve. So as it relates to adolescents, we've said that most adolescents or most HPV infections occur in adolescents. Most adolescents become infected after their sexual exposure. And why nine-year-olds are really important is that the majority of nine-year-olds aren't exposed to HPV infection. So it's a really good time, as with any vaccine, to give people the vaccines before they're exposed to the disease you're trying to prevent. As it relates to HPV infection, it's divided into low-risk types and high-risk types. The high-risk types are predominantly HPV-6 and HPV-11, and they're responsible for over 90% of genital warts, as well as respiratory papillomatosis. If you ask an adolescent, they care more about genital warts than they actually uh, think about cancer. But it is those high-risk types and persistent infections. Remember, I said most infections will resolve. 
persistent infections with high risk types 16, 18, 31, 33, 42, I'm sorry, 45, 52, and 58 are those that can develop into cancer and other precancerous lesions. And this usually doesn't occur actually in adolescence. It usually occurs after several decades and the actual cancers present or manifest in adulthood. But remember, we can prevent this by vaccination to prevent new HPV infections. So just to um, articulate what that really means is, even if someone has had an HPV infection in the past, it's still important to give them the vaccine because you can prevent other types. And you can see there are several types listed here. And so they would be protected from any new HPV infections. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the HPV attributable cancers, particularly when we're thinking about um, uh, disparities and all of the opportunities for cancer prevention that we have with the HPV vaccine. So annually, there are over 34,000 cancers attributable to HPV. And although we focus so much on cervical cancer, we should remember that HPV is a leading cause of not only cervical cancer, but vaginal cancer, vulvar cancer, penile cancer, anal cancer, and oral pharyngeal cancer. And in fact, the vaccine is now licensed for the prevention of all of these cancers with the exception of penile cancer. Actually, when the vaccine was licensed in 2006, it was licensed at the onset for cervical cancer, vaginal cancer, and vulvar cancer um, protection, although it was marketed more for cervical cancer. What's most important for you also to see here, and, and please go back to the other slide, is that males and females actually have um, cervical cancer. I'm sorry, they also have HPV attributable cancers. And when we think of the most common cancer for, for women or females, it is cervical cancer. For males, it's actually oral pharyngeal cancer. But the next slide actually shows something that I want you to see that's important. So we already see that there are some gender disparities on that previous slide. But let's look at oral pharyngeal cancer. What I want people to understand is that in fact, oral pharyngeal cancer is more prevalent than cervical cancer. And it actually surpassed cervical cancer in 2010. And it's actually more common in women. So again, I'm sorry, more common, most common in men. So we're gonna talk more specifically about some of the health disparities that we see in HPV. We've already talked about some of the gender disparities, particularly when it's oral pharyngeal cancer. Here we see HPV associated cervical cancer rates by race and ethnicity. Uh, probably not surprising to many of us, Black and Hispanic women, which are indicated by the green and purple bars, have higher rates of cervical cancer than white, which is exemplified by the red bars, non-Hispanic women. However, Hispanic women have the highest rates of cervical cancer. But if we were into, to be able to include mortality in this slide, we would actually find that Black women have the highest mortality. On this slide, we look at HPV rates of anal cancer rates by race and ethnicity and sex. And what we find here is that uh, rate, uh, anal cancer is actually lower in Black women than it is in white women, although the differences are actually small. But what's important to note, if you look at by gender, all women, and it's if you, except for Black women, um, actually have higher rates of anal cancer and rectal cancer than men. And this is often contrary to kind of popular thought about uh, anal cancer rates. So thinking about the gender rates, males, except for um, black males, generally have lower cancer rates than uh, females. And when we look at it by race and ethnicity, white women have actually higher cancer rates than black women and Hispanic women. And so remember, when we think about disparities, it doesn't always mean that people of color have the worst uh, outcomes or the worst uh, prevalence of disease. I want us to take an opportunity to talk about vaginal cancer rates. And thankfully, vaginal cancer is rare. There are about 800 new cases in the United States annually. However, if you happen to be one of those uh, individuals who gets it, it has a significant impact on families. When we look at these cancer rates by uh, race, we can find, in fact, that more Black and Hispanic women 
get HPV associated cancer than women of other races and ethnicities, including um, American Indians and Asian Pacific individuals. So I wanted to take a moment to talk a little bit about vulvar cancer. And I also wanna remind us that vulvar cancer and vaginal cancer were actually covered initially when the vaccine was first licensed in 2006. While that vulvar cancer is also rare, it's actually more common than vaginal cancer. And there are about 3,700 cases annually. When we look at the prevalence of these rates, we can see in fact that it is actually more common about, among uh, non-Hispanic white women. I wanna talk a little about some other HPV associated cancer disparities. So we've already talked about gender, we've talked about race and ethnicity. In this slide, we'll also talk about SES. So just as a reminder, when we look at oral pharyngeal cancers and all races and ethnicity, men have higher rates than women. And when we look by race white among men, white men have higher rates than black and Hispanic men. We look at penile cancer and remember penile cancer is the only cancer currently that is not um, indicated for coverage uh, by the HPV vaccine currently, but I'm hoping that will change in the future. But a very, very important marker is SES or socioeconomic status. No matter what cancer we look at, um, individuals who live in high poverty areas are more likely to both develop and die from cervical cancer, but they're also more likely to have higher rates of penile, anal, vaginal, vulvar, and oral pharyngeal ca uh, cancer. So when we think about poverty as well as race, because remember race is, is not a biological construct, it's a sociological construct, it's complex and multifactorial. And so there are lots of things that go into uh, those particular variables, even including kind of social networks and the prevalence of disease. And so what are some key points, particularly as it relates to vaccination at age nine? Getting vaccinated at age nine gives us increased potential to, to vaccinate young people before they are gonna be exposed uh, to the agents of HPV or the virus, the HPV virus. Starting at nine also gives us more opportunities to vaccinate because there will be more health visits during the time period of, you know, when children are younger. Other key points at starting at age nine is that at age nine, it gives you more opportunity to pay attention to the social determinants of health, to work on issues of equity and access, and to really think about increasing this opportunity to prevent health disparities from HPV preventable diseases. And so the, we modeled, of course, cervical cancer, but this could be for all the cancers that we looked um, at or that we know that are attributable to HPV. So thank you so much for your time and the opportunity to present to you today. And I look forward to also hearing the presentations from my colleagues.